Welcome to the Layman Seminary. Today we're continuing a series on a debate preparation. And yeah, now it's official since SFT made the uh, the thumbnail. My de next debate is going to be with Travis Thomas, who's Church of Christ. And it's going to be over free grace theology represented by me versus uh, Lordship Salvation, which is uh, his form of it. Because there is an Armenian form of Lordship Salvation, and they're probably on the extreme side of things about that but what is true biblical salvation so um that uh yesterday that was 40 days away now it's 39 days away and so i'm just going to continue the series i updated the previous video and inserted his name in there once it was official so yeah and let's continue okay um as i'm coming at this I, I did some research because I was going through, we're going mainly going through Fred Che's uh, book on faith that saves or saving faith. And uh, um, he uses some terms out here that, that I searched within Logos to find as represented. I just wanted to see what, re what resources would Logos bring up in the fat book? Like which ones would they uh, say, well, this is the key resource that you need to look at for that. And so one of those resources that came up for uh, I think it's lexical is what we're talking about is the is the Thesotin, uh companion to Christian theology. I I know his name for his systematic theology circles and things like that and maybe even hermeneutics, but I've never used this resource. But in it, as you can see, this is what comes up underneath fact fact book is uh, lexography. Is you know it talks about the study of that. And so it says lexography includes the practice of compiling or using dictionary meanings. Because that's what this video is mainly going to be focused on today is the lexography uh, behind the word studies that are preparing that way. We're not going to go into the Septuagint stuff until the next video, I think, is where I'm going to begin there. Um, the larger the lexicon, the dictionary, the more it will take account of specific context and text or even of unusual examples. And so it mentions the Badag. It mentions the the lamp for the patristic period, and it misses little Scott Jones for classical Greek. Um, so whenever you're defining a semantic range of a word, you move from classical uh, Lewis Scott and Jones, right? Then you move to Septuagint, then you do Koine with Moulton and Milligan dealing with the papyri, and then you go into New Testament usage. Uh, and but whenever you're but whenever you're considering the context of how much this is influence on the New Testament, you start with the New Testament, you look at the Koine, you consider the Septuagint, and you consider classical last. Okay, so you move you move from classical that way and then back out. Um, because you want to determine the meaning and the context. And then after you do that, then you would check the badag. You don't just don't run to the bag and run with everything it says. Um so just for word study purposes, this is a good resource, not just for word study, but for hermeneutics in general, a good, uh, uh, if you want to dive into hermeneutics, it's got exercises into it. There's other works besides this one, but this is one that, that I've always found handy to run to uh, at a basic level. And so we're going to look at what it says about lexography. So what is grammatical interpretation? It includes the meaning of words, lexo lexicology, the form of words, morphology, the function of words, part speech, and the relationship of words, syntax. So I was like, okay, now we're, we got we got lexography, and now let's go into etymology. Well, what's shocking is I typed in etymology in the fact book, and what it brought up was the New Dictionary Catholic Spirituality. I'm like, wait a minute, what's going on there? But whenever I clicked on the resource, it's describing the etymology of the word for service. It, it, it's not describing what etymology is. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but it just shows you that your Bible software is is not infallible. Um, but another resource that whenever I did a regular search for etymology to see what all came up, and that's outside of fact book, this one came up again. I made reference to this one in the first video, uh, Dictionary Hermeneutics, a Concise Guide to Terms, Names, Methods, and Expressions. And so here it's making the statement about etymology. Uh, and it says proper use of etymology often results in the error defining a word by combining the meaning of its linguistic parts. And then it makes a reference to Carson. Um, so once again, back to Zuck. 
In the meaning of lexicology, we are concerned with etymology, how words are derived and developed. Okay. Let me see if I see. Usage, how words are used by the same authors, synonyms and anonyms, how similar and opposite words are used in context, how words are used in various, that's lexicology. But here we're focusing on etymology. It says four factors influence the meaning of a given word. Etymology uses synonyms, antonyms, and context. So it says examine the etymology of the words. Etymology refers to the root deviation and development of words. Okay. Sometimes the component parts of a compound word help reveal its meaning. I'm not going to give the examples of it. You can go back and look at the resource or you can look at the screen, but I just want you to hear that assertion. Uh, but this guy, Johann Nernsti, in 1707, uh, 1781, warned against following etymology as a reliable guide. Okay, so there was a warning early on about that. There are but few words in any language which always retain their primary meaning. Okay, uh, therefore, it is necessary to interpret it to guard against rash etymological exegesis, which is often very fallacious. Okay, here's the next principle. Sometimes a word in its development takes on an entirely different meaning from what it originally meant. So it gives examples of that. Sometimes a word means something entirely different from its component parts. Gives examples of those. A biblical word should not be explained on the basis of its English etymology. Keep that in mind. Sometimes Bible interpreters note the meaning of a Greek word in classical Greek, and they suggest that the same meaning carries over into the New Testament Greek. That procedure, however, could sometimes lead to inaccurate meanings. Discover the usage of word. As already stated, often the etymology of a word does not help determine its meaning. Therefore, we need to determine its current established usage by the writer. This process is called uh, usus loquende, literally the use by the one speaking. In other words, what was the customary meaning of the word when the writer used it? How he used the word in his context often helps determine its meaning. This is especially important because a word carries different meanings depending on how it's used. As we would discuss later, the immediate context often, though not always, helps determine the meaning of a word. It is important to note several kinds of usage. First, note the usage of a word by the same writer in the same book. Second, note the usage by the same writer in his other books. Third, note the usage by other writers in the Bible. Fourth, note how the word is used by writers outside the Bible. Discover the meanings of similar words, synonyms and opposite words, antonyms. Consider the context. Considering the context is extremely important for three reasons. Uh, so it's talking about multiple meanings. How they are used in a given context can help determine which of several meanings is more likely? Second, thoughts are usually expressed by a series of words and sentences that is in association, not isolation. Third, false in interpretations often rise from ignoring the context. Several kinds of context should be considered, the immediate context. The point here is that as a general rule, each occurrence of a word would normally have only one of its possible senses and that meaning is usually determined by the context and in these verses by the immediate context. All right, so it's talking about the, it, it actually had the example here of the word faith. And since that's related to the video, I'll go ahead and share this. For another example, the word faith can mean trust or confidence in God, faithfulness, a body of truth, or intellectual assent. And it gives examples. Use faith in one of these four meanings. In another of these senses, it's used in these. Uh, and then it, then it gives an assignment. Look up these verses and seek to determine the meaning for each of these occurrences of and faith and, and and so it does the same thing with the word salvation or saved and it says it could be used for five ways and just for y'all's purposes i'll just mention these five safety or deliverance from difficult circumstances physical or emotional health israel's natural release national release from oppression by our enemies deliverance from the penalty of sin by the substitution of death of christ final deliverance from the presence of sin so once you look them up and place those in there Okay, parallel passage also serves as helpful context for ascertaining the meaning of certain words or passages. Another context to be considered is the entire Bible. Two colorways of this principle and known in the context of the entire Bible are these. An obscure or ambiguous text should never be interpreted in such a way as to make it contradict a plain one. Uh, a complex, ingenious, or devious interpretation should not be given preference over a simple and more natural explanation. 
In view of this section on the meaning of words, lexicology, the following principles should be kept in mind. A word does not usually mean what it originally meant, nor is its meaning often determined by its component parts. The meanings of words in English should not be read back into the biblical meaning. The same word may have different meanings in its various occurrences in the Bible. Each word or phrase normally has only one meaning, which is indicated by its usage in a sentence and or of several other contexts. The same word in the Bible does not always mean the same thing. A word should not be given all its shades of meaning in any one occurrence. Okay, so here's one of the words that we're going to be talking about, the pistuo. And you can see the range of meaning here. And I want to just point this out right now. According to this word ring, the range of meaning does not include obey for pistuo anywhere. Okay. Now, pistis, uh, let's see if there's any. According to this, there's no range of meaning for obey in this sense from the word. Now, uh, this research by Colin Brown is one of the ones I'm fixing to quote. And uh, um, so here's that one. And so this is uh, this is not from the Logos version, but it's the one that I have. Faith, persuade, belief, and unbelief. So when it starts discussing these words, notice it has patho or patho my uh, showed up first as a reference. So you go here and you get into this discussion of how it's to be interpreted. And you see here the stem paith, pith or poith, has the basic meaning of trust, Latin fidel, fides. The same stem is also the basic of the form for pis, pistuo. Uh, to trust can refer to a statement so that it has a meaning to put faith in, to let oneself be convinced, or to demand so that it gets the meaning of obey, be persuaded. Now what's going on is they're saying that that this word, patho, has the, uh, the stem of pith. And this is how they're arguing from that. Uh, exegetical fallacies uh, is a good book. D.A. Carson is helpful in this. Not saying he commit doesn't commit any fallacies in the book uh, himself, but it's very helpful. And one of the fallacies he warns about, because if you're going to take pith as the basis for understanding patho and possibly even business, then you need to be aware of the root fallacy. One of the most enduring of errors, the root fallacy presupposes that every word actually has a meaning bound up with its shape or its components. In this view, meaning is determined by etymology, that is by the root or roots of a word. So he gives examples of that. Now he says here, this is important. I am simply saying that the meaning of a word cannot be reliable deter reliably determined by etymology, or that a root once discovered always projects a certain semantic load onto any word that incorporates the root. He says that it must be inductively observed to specify the meaning of a word in the particular context, but we must not freight such talk with too much etymological baggage. The second caveat is that the meaning of a word may reflect the meaning of its component parts. Now, this is important because a lot of people see the, the, the etymological fallacy or compound fallacy and say, oh, you can't say that. That's butterfly or, or that's pineapple fallacy or whatever. But look what he says here. He says the word may reflect the meaning of its component parts. So it's a case-by-case -case issue, okay? The second caveat, right, we already said that. The meaning of a word may reflect its etymology. And it must be admitted this is more common in synthetic languages like Greek or German with a relatively high percentage of transparent words than a language like English. But look at this. Even so, my point is that we cannot responsibly assume the etymology, etym etymology is related to meaning. We can only test the point by discovering the meaning of a word inductively. So if you're tracing etymology, you need to go back and see if it's used this way outside the Bible and inside the Bible. Finally, I am far from suggesting that etymological studies is useless. Okay. Um, but he says this, he mentions reasons why it's helpful. But it says the relative value of this use of etymology, uh, etymology varies inversely with the quantity of material available for the language. So if there's not a lot of uh, 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 material available for the study of the word from extra biblical stuff or even in within the Bible. then it's very difficult to use etymo etymo etymology to determine the meaning 
because it, it could not it necessarily may not be a representative sample of what's going on and it's not inductively um, demonstrated okay now um this lexicon came out and this is a rival or a compliment however you want you want to look at it to uh badag now i think this one focuses on classical greek and uh papyri and all of that similar uh i'm not sure if it mentions christian works in here or not i think it does i haven't had as much use with it as i have had the, with the badag but um this book kind of rolled back some of the real strong uh accusations or, or or concerns about etymological uh study because it does do etymological study there's the bedag that's the standard usually okay now the theological dictionary of the old testament this is a uh, kittle and uh um i think this is kittle um and so keep in mind a lexicon is not the same thing as a theological dictionary now, a lexicon is a dictionary, but a theological dictionary lets you know that you're going beyond words. You're creating motifs. You're look, your theology is getting more in the way. Now, that doesn't mean that no one's theology gets in into this lexicon, because obviously it does. But it just, be careful not to use a theological dictionary like a lexicon, and also be careful when you're reading a lexicon for theological presuppositions that are involved there. Um. So um, it, underneath uh, the, the theological dictionary of the Old Testament concerning the word aman, the Hebrew word for faith or trust, it says the meaning of a word cannot be inferred from the more or less certain etymolo etymology, but only by careful study of the way it's used in the language. All right, so basically you have the charge of the root fallacy, right? And so the idea being is that you have patho, uh, patho being read into the meaning of pastuo. But what this author is later on going to say or demonstrate is that he thinks that even if they have the same root in the beginning, their their semantic domains separated. So obey and persuade was on the patho side of things, but obey never comes over in the pastuo side of things. Um, so here's pith, here's pistis coming off pastuo and patho. So you have trust and obey on this side and faith on this side. Now, whenever I did my run for this, I looked for the root of pastuo and it's pastuo, according to this. It didn't bring up pith. When I did the uh, same thing for, uh, I'm sorry, that was the root of pistis. When I did the same thing for pastuo, pastuo came up. So here's our word patho again. I notice it mentions obey, but this is obey as in convince. So that could actually be tied into persuaded, believe, and convince, but only a small sliver means to obey. And so they say that the root, the claim is this, is that pith means to bind, and that this came to mean to bind in the sense of for obedience. And so that could relate to faithfulness and things like that. So does pistis have the same root? That's one question you got to ask. Whenever I looked up to obey uh, uh, patho, it brought up these two passages, Galatians 6, 1 and James 3, 3. Okay. Well, whenever I ran uh, the um, how patho is being used, you can see obeying uh, right here. And you can see the passages that are brought up. Romans 2, 8. But obey on righteousness, Galatians 5, 7. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Uh, Hebrews 13, 7. Obey your leaders and submit to them. James 3, 3. Now, if you put the bits in horses' mouths so that they will obey us. Okay, here's patho. And so you got this small sliver that's only translated as patho, uh, as obey. So if patho means convince, persuade, trust, or satisfy which they say is rare, then what's going on here with obey? So you have pistis and you have patho. One is a noun, which Che cautions is like, you got to be careful to read a verbal idea into a noun because it says a noun does not have inherent action. 
And I got a question mark here because I'm aware of certain things within Greek and in Hebrew that can imply verbal force into these. But so in a footnote, he starts discussing participles and he says, uh, where participles, participles are part verb and part adjective. So while an adjective is not a noun per se, and so I was like, what does per se mean? I use it all the time. Well, come to find out, per se means in and of itself, which is another term I used, or intrinsically. So it's kind of like um, necessarily almost. Um, so an adjective modifies a noun, right? So if you have a sub an adjectival participle, it's modifying a noun. But if you have a substantival adjective, the example of that would be good, bad, and ugly. So a substantival substitutes as a noun. Well, the same thing with substantival participles. But Che still says, even though all this talked about in a footnote, that this reality about substantival participles or the use of participles that can have a verbal force um, should not be used to freight verbal ideas into pistis, which means faith, trust, and confidence. Uh, and then it says that pistis may or may not have an object. So whenever we're talking about whether it has an object or not, you'll hear me in my videos or teaching say faith always has an object. But I'm talking about a semantic object, the one you believe in, the, the proposition that you believe true, those things like that. So I'm not talking about grammatical object necessarily. So in the Journal of, of Evangelical Society, uh. This uh, article by Michael D. Makedon uh, is concerning sociological terms with Bauer's Greek lexicon. So this is about the Badag. And so for the most part, those who teach the New Testament from the original language have come to trust Walter Bauer's lexical work. While much of the research is invaluable, teachers will be well advised to make sure that it corresponds to scripture before making lasting judgments. The Greek words, pastuo, Dikaiao to be declared righteous in apatheo, apeto, peteo, to disobey or disbelieve, bear this out. So saying you need to go look and see because Badag's got those wrong. And so here's in the article, it makes a distinction between the Badag tomb, which is also called the uh, Bagad, and the Badag uh, right here. So you have believe in, trust, the religious belief in a special sense is faith in the divinity that lay special emphasis on trust in his power and his nearness to help, in addition to being convinced that he exists and that his revelations or disclosures are true. In our literature, God and Christ are objects of this faith. And in the Badag, it says to trust oneself to an entity in complete confidence, believe in our trust, with implication of total commitment to the one who is trusted. So this is what's been added, okay? And we'll have to study this to bear and see if it bears out whether it's biblical or not. Uh, in our literature, God and Christ, the objects of faith and rely on the power and nearest help, in addition to being convinced that revelation and disclosure are true. Now, I'll tell you up in advance that this is going to be taken as a theological thing that's read it into the text rather than having lexical support. Um, so this is an article by Botha. I, I wrote a paper on repentance that used his interaction stuff, but I got this from a uh, JSTOR site. You can create a free account. And so you go in here and he's talking about the, uh, you know, uh, Pastuo all, all throughout. And it's an interesting article. I have not read it fully through, but I've skimmed it. And so listen what it says right here, the standard dictionaries and Pastuo. And so what year was this? 1987. Perhaps one of the reasons for this unsatisfactory condition today is that the standard works dealing with the meaning of words available to theologians and exegetes are still representative of linguistic and lexicographer theories current at the turn of the century. So you're talking 1800s at that time. New editions are just reprints, and there's no real change in the basic presuppositions underlying the, uh, the compilation of such works. A further factor is that traditional dictionaries are viewed as the only and best sources for meaning and are considered infallible. The user of dictionaries is not aware of the problems in these works and without reserve implements what was found there in exegesis and word studies. This is, of course, unsatisfactory because dictionaries can indeed contain serious mistakes. 
Dictionaries dealing with pastuo do not present a unified picture as to the meaning at that time. Uh, for the word, for detailed discussion on the way certain standard dictionaries deal with pastuo, see both the in, in a 1985 article. Here, only a few general marks can be made on the mainly the dictionary of Thayer's, Little, Scott, Bauer, and Muller. The first three are standard works used widely by New Testament scholars. All right, so then he has a discussion here about illegitimate totality transfer, which is a, a, a logical fallacy. Let me get a drink of water. He said, this is something which user dictionaries must be aware of, for it occurs rather frequently in dictionaries. Theological dictionaries, exegesis, and so on. A word is considered to carry more than one meaning in the same context, or to have part of one meaning and part of another simultaneously. Bauer's dictionary gives for a pastuo faith that lays special emphasis on trust. Obviously, the focus here is on trust, which is one of the meaning for which pastuo can be used. But then he continues, and as part of the meaning gives, in addition to being convinced that he exists and that his revelations and disclosures are true, here another meaning of pastuo is correlated with the first. And then uh, he gives, a, uh, namely, the meaning to accept something is true. Pastuo cannot both mean both these things at the same time. Illegitimate total transfer has taken place. That's the assertion. Okay, so now Che goes into uh, Moulton and Milligan. Okay, and uh, this is the 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 lexicon, if you will, that that helps with uh, um, papyri, which is the Koine Greek uh, at the time of the writing of the Bible, basically. And and before and after, I think it says between third century BC and eighth century <laughs> AD. Excuse me, guys. So Moulton and Milligan have this for pistis. In accordance with its New Testament common uses, pistis to use the faith, confidence in a person in such passages as a follow. This is the passive sense, fidelity, fidelity, faithfulness, which is found in the Septuagint and occasionally in the New Testament. That's the assertion. For the sense of guarantee or pledge, it's even to be used. And pistis can even refer to a bond or a mortgage and found in such passages. All right, so right here, it, it talks about pastuo. And it says, you know, it, it's it's rare um, than pistis. But you basically have the verb form of that. In other words, to believe means to put faith in and uh, um, or to trust. And so right here you have examples where it says, I've trusted no one to take her um, from the papyri. So you could have it translated like that. I believe that you're aware how much trouble I had. So you have it translated like that. That I may no longer be believed with regard to my embarkation. Same thing there. All right, so now back to um, both of So then the results of each entry must be correlated with all others, keeping in mind that often other translational equivalents are at stake and not a real difference in lexical meaning. Based on these findings, a synthesis in the form of lists of possible meanings must be drawn up and sequentially validated against the New Testament. The meaning for which pastuo can possibly use were fairly clear in all the dictionaries, namely, one, accept that something is correct and truthful, two, to entrust somebody with something, and three, to place trust or something on somebody. Some of the dictionaries also identify the meaning for, to be a Christian and to obey. The next step is to validate these five meanings against the Bible. Each and every passage in the New Testament where pastuo is used must be determined and compared with the results yielded by an examination of the dictionaries. Lexical meaning refers to that which pastuo and pastuo alone contributes to the understanding of the passage. It was found that four of the meanings abstracted from the dictionaries indeed are valid meanings for pastuo. However, a fifth one, to obey, cannot be validated in the New Testament. A careful examination of the dictionary showed where this no notion occurred. And so he traces it back to Van Dines in 1883 and Bartenik in 1958, on the grounds that the assumed meaning of pastuo is in some of uh, Sophocles' uh, tragedies. But an examination of these passages, according to him, revealed that the implication of pastuo in those contexts was mistaken for the meaning of pastuo. So the implication was substituted for the meaning. 
The fifth meaning of bestow could have the implication of obedience in some context. The other four meanings, which is the result of the dictionary examination, seem possible and are deemed meanings for which bestow can be used. We would discuss one example of each meaning where the meaning is fairly clear. The four meanings of bestow in the New Testament are as follows. And so you have the range of meaning right here. Make reference to that. And there's patho, which you see, and this goes back to most of these are all in the same camp, except for this one to obey. So um, what is this I'm looking at? Oh, this is still Molten and Milligan. So for patho, it says for the canota present, apply persuasion, seek to persuade. For the middle or passive means am persuaded, uh, and so it gives resources for that. Um, it says that patho, the word passes into the meaning obey in the letter of a, a curious to a, uh, to a child. Okay, so this is what I was saying is that it, 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 assuming that the root actually is pith, then the words patho and pistis came from that. But there's a there's a semantic domain split where patho took persuade and obey and pistis only took uh believe trust and and things like that and so this one goes this way and this one goes this way so he brings out uh che brings out that patho was not used in john except in john 336 where a negative is being used there so here's that passage he who believes in the son has eternal life but he does not Obey the Son when I see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So not obey, that's the passage in question. And when you search it, apatheo is the form of it. You can see the passage mentioned here. And so it deals with that first category. In 1 John 3, 19, it's also used. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before him. This is the NASB. The word assure is, is pathos, so it could be persuade. Because when you're assuring somebody, you're persuading them of something. Um, so once again, the order that you're supposed to go is classical Greek, Septuagint, Koine, Mulchin and Milligan, New Testament Greek. Then go back uh, go back up. That Okay, which has more significance? New Testament, Koine, and so on. Um, to determine the meaning and context and check the badag. So that's it. So if that was beneficial to you, Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the bell with notifications. Give us a thumbs up for the algorithm purpose. Uh, let us know what you think of the content personally. Of course, the thumbs up does show that. And, of course, comments. And uh, share this with others if you think they're blessed by it. And uh, um, most of all, please keep this ministry in prayer. Now, if you want to, uh, to donate, feel God's blessed you through the ministry, there's a PayPal link that you can uh, find in the about section or underneath most videos. God bless.